It's, it's only fair. I was late to the other the panel that I was late to the panel that Monty was uh, Monty and I were sharing. So it's only only fitting that that Monty will show up in a couple minutes. Uh, we have two mics. We can actually hand out a third. Can you guys do a quick mic check? Yeah. Good check afternoon. Check. I got the loudest mic naturally, which I don't need at all. So uh, my name is Rob Hirschfeld. I was asked. Uh, volunteered, perhaps, to moderate the interoperability panel uh, because I have the unfortunate tendency of speaking up about, moder <laughs> not the only one on this panel, of speaking up about interoperability and its importance and some of the challenges that we face about it. So um, I, I managed to pull together some people who have very diverse perspectives on interoperability and experience. And so I'm hoping that we can have a lively debate to get everybody ready for beer and cocktails. And uh, I have prepared a list of questions. I don't have sufficient devices up here to monitor the Twitter stream. But uh, if you have a pressing question, come up to the mic. And uh, we will wind you in. And with that, I will remind you, keep your answers short, please. We, we have a limited number of mics, so you're going to have to ask for mics to do it. Uh, could you please, uh, we'll start with Troy, uh, give us a brief introduction. Uh, Troy Toman, I run the cloud, uh, public cloud infrastructure team at uh, Rackspace, and I'm also an OpenStack board member, so I will probably be switching some hats during the, during the discussion. Hello, I'm uh, Peter Pouliot. I'm the individual uh, who works on OpenStack at Microsoft. <laughs> I, I can't follow that. <laughs> don't, don't sell yourself short, Josh. Joshua McKenzie, uh, co-founder of Piston Cloud, OpenSec board member, um, the unfortunate soul who was supposed to organize this panel and then asked Bob to do it. Um, and uh, apparently I'm the, the rad bastard who talked to the press about Interop <laughs> before we were due to do that. So uh, this is kind of my fault. Uh, I'm Jonathan LaCour. I'm the vice president of product and development at DreamHost, uh, where we have a public cloud based on OpenStack and preview called Dream Compute. I'm Bernard Golden. I'm Vice President of Enterprise Solutions for Stratius, and we're a cloud management uh, company, cloud management software company, and we certainly know about the issues of interoperability. But I have to say, I thought when you s started off by saying, I want you to keep your, question, your answers, I thought you were going to say clean. <laughs> no, that is not required. Not brief. Welcome to drop whatever additional expletives uh, and adjectives are necessary. Uh, just remember the we are Twitter enabled. Uh, and actually, if, if you would and want to tweet about this, please include the hashtag interop. And uh, that will help people track, track our, our back channel if we have one. Um, so to get rolling, inter we keep saying the word interop, which is short for interoperability. Uh, can you give a two sentence? I'll start with Bernard, a two-sentence uh, definition of what it means. Um, well, in the previous panel, people were discussing these sorts of things. Interoperability means I have to be able to shift a workload from one platform to another. I'm not as convinced that that is the case, but certainly I think um, I have to have uh, a sense of consistency among different providers. So that would be a consistent API level, um, consistent functionality. I would go so far as to say that interoperability, uh, you know, is one of those things that a lot of people sort of give lip service to, but only is shown in the basis of stuff actually working. Every interoperability standard I've ever seen is toothless unless you actually have tests that people have to go through and validate against with somebody who certifies it to. I, I already gave you the hall pass. Yeah. I gave you the hall pass. That um, then they are able to certify that something is actually truly interoperable. So that was uh, that was actually an excellent answer. I was going to say to me, I agree. It's not so much about necessarily the complete transparency of moving workloads, you know, between providers. It's more about API consistency, not only in um, which APIs are offered. I think that's actually kind of a, an important thing because OpenStack is growing really quickly in terms of not just its functionality but also its scope additional projects kind of growing up around the edges of the OpenStack. And those are additional APIs to support. But 
knowing what those core functionality, core APIs are, and ensuring that they behave consistently across providers. And I agree that uh, having some way to measure ourselves is, is very desirable. Um, being able to know uh, where we stand um, when it comes to interoperability with other providers. Um, so I thought it was interesting you said to, I mean, what you basically implied was it's a gradient, and then you turned around and said it's an API with consistent behavior. Um, I figured we could take it out of the technical domain. Say if I have a car, and I have a hole where gasoline goes in, interoperable means if it fits in the hole, it doesn't blow up my engine, right? And so the, the API is the size of the hole. I mean, I don't know if you have, have diesel cars. But <laughs> I, I really want somebody to and, and it's, it's Can somebody retweet it. the API is the size of the hole, please? <laughs> so that goes. I wanted to start strong, right? Yeah. I can get away with this because I'm wearing the Mr. Rogers sweater, so no one will assume that I had a wicked intent to that phrase. Huh. So I guess uh, from my perspective, um, you know, interoperability is the area at which we allow vendors to be able to plug into the ecosystem, bringing their products to the table, right? So from an OpenStack perspective, I shouldn't care which vendor comes in uh, and brings their solution to be part of uh, OpenStack sort of uh, implementation, but we should have the ability to uh, create that environment, in our case with consistent APIs, to allow anybody to come in and plug in behind it. Uh, and, and that's the area, you know, being able to have multiple vendors with different agenda in the same uh, sort of technological space working together is, is really the, the true meaning of uh, interoperability from my perspective. So uh, from our perspective, at the API part has been covered, I think we would agree that that's a critical part, that, that they're consistent and they behave consistently. The other two areas that we tend to focus a lot on our thinking around interoperability is image interchange. So it's not necessarily about live migration of workloads across multiple clouds, but I'd like to be able to know that if I have a workload, if I have an image, if I have a capability, that, that, will, that I can take that and move that to something, maybe not real time, but in, in some way. So private to public, public to public, that's another piece. The third piece, which I think is evolving and a little bit further out, but we also spend a lot of time with, is network interoperability. So how do I, how do I know that I can connect workloads in different clouds in a way that, that is somewhat consistent as well? So it's, it's kind of those three, I would say, in, those, in that priority order from, from our, our standpoint that, that are the big focus items that we pay attention to. Okay. I'm going to keep, I'm going to come back the other way and then I'm going to interrupt the chairs. Um, I don't think I got to answer that question. Oh, I'm sorry, buddy. Well, you were late. Yes, <laughs> you were right. I, you were being skipped. That's okay. I, I uh, snuck in can you, here. Can yeah. you give yourself um, a brief introduction and then oh, define gosh. interrupt? I, I don't know about the first one. That one is a little bit hard. Uh, my name is Monty Taylor. I work for Hewlett Packard. Uh, sit on the foundation board and the technical committee, and uh, was around when we started this crazy thing, and seem to still be here, which is a bit crazy. Um, and uh, also. Uh, heavily involved in running the uh, the CI and uh, OpenStack CI infrastructure systems, um, which is actually where I would come to the the definition of interoperability. Um, we right now run all of the project testing across a combination of HP and Rackspace's public clouds, um, and it's not so much about moving a workload as it is that we have defined the workload consistently across that as if those two clouds were one cloud. Um, and so what I would like to see is all of these various different open stacks behave sort of like the internet or the web in that rather than thinking about all of the different web servers uh, and how those might interoperate with each other, the, the web itself seems as if it is one large thing. Um, and I would love to get to the point where we have just an open stack cloud that HP provides endpoints for and Rackspace provides endpoints for and Aptera and DreamHost and uh, even Avance and everybody else. And there's private ones because you have private web servers and you have private uh, internet connected things in your home or whatever. And um, so that might be a little bit uh, nebulous, but uh, uh, that's, that's, that's my perfect happy unicorn rainbow. That's good. You have words like nebulous and canonical, which have very good technical meanings. They're the just. Opposite. I've been, have been, have been sort of, Captured. We have no words left to use in the cloud <laughs> ecosystem that are not overloaded. Like cloud. Like cloud. Or so, ecosystem. So passing, <laughs> passing, or passing the, Troy, if you would, I'll, I'll give you lead on this one. 
Um, some of the reason for this panel is because we are using, we're throwing around interop as a statement, as a, as a bad thing, as a, as a claim. We, we sort of get in trouble talking about interop, right? There was an article recently that gave rise to this panel talking about how HP and Rackspace's clouds did not interoperate. Um, so can we actually make statements like that? Are they fair statements? Is it reasonable and then for you and then everybody else? Um, yeah, the simple answer to that question is I think we can make those statements. I mean, I, I, don't, I, the, I don't think they are interoperable. I think there's a lot of reasons um, for that. In our particular case, we were trying to actually get a, a product to market. We had to lock down what that was gonna look like while OpenStack was still moving. Um, we locked it down, we got a product to market, we proved that it worked at a point where everybody was saying we didn't know if OpenStack worked and we felt good about that, but then it was, it's gotta work like everybody else's, which is a fair expectation. Um, I highlighted this a little bit at the keynote I did at the last summit. I did a blog post on where I think we've got gaps that we need to work on to keep going, so we, we definitely see it, we wanna work on it. I think one of the things that's missing um, that was actually in the, in the infamous article that Josh was quoted in, he, he referenced the fact that by the defined interoperability standards, we're not compliant with OpenStack. And I think actually that implies there's a well-defined inter... That's what it was quoted. It, it is, That's what it was written. So, so it, it, there, uh, there was nuance. Okay. Everyone it, in the ecosystem is in compliance with those defined standards because they are incredibly broad. They basically say you have to run Nova and you have to run Swift. Yes. And that is it. Right, and my point was gonna be, I think the missing point is we haven't actually defined it's left up to every individual implementer of OpenStack to make their determination about interoperable and what looks right. And you know, part of it is I made a guess, the guys at HP made a guess, Pistons made a guess, and some people have guessed more alike than others. But you know, I think, I think this is a big problem for us to actually define what it means so that we're all working at the same thing. Can I respond to that? So the original effort to solve this, we kicked off two years ago, if you recall, this was copying what Simon Crosby had done with Zen Server, and we started FITS, the Faithful Implementation Test Suite. And we ran smack into the central issue of interop, which we still have not solved. And in the latest resurrection of FITS, which is now the RefStack interop project that Monty and I and Rob have been working on, we're ignoring that problem right now so that we can get something done. Um, everybody in, in this panel basically said interop is about the API which is the assumption we are taking with RefStack is we are going to test the API of every product and service and then use the results of that API scorecard to say how interoperable, because it is a gradient, which I think Bernard pointed out. What we're saying is the API matters and what code you're running under that API does not. And that is the two paths to interrupt that we have never been able to get to a consensus on. There was the first meeting we ever had for FITS was that debate, we ran into the wall, and we abandoned that until we had a foundation to enforce it with. I yeah, know. no, and I, I think, you know, we are at a point, hopefully, where we can move forward on that. I, and I actually have that as a standalone question, so I, I wanna. I, I guess, I don't even know where to come in on this one. Um, you know, from a, I guess, yeah, I know, from a, from a cloud to cloud interoperability standpoint, you know, we have to, it, obviously, in some cases, deployment choices might ultimately break interoperability whatever it is that you're uh, looking to achieve in terms of that interoperability. So, you know, the, uh, I guess a broad definition is obviously necessary. Because obviously, you know, from my standpoint, in a situation where I'm using Windows as my hypervisor, right, I'm obviously have a completely different operational environment that I have to adhere to just to get that deployment out there. Now obviously, you know, from a project perspective, you try to stay as close to everybody else uh, to keep it that pain equal. But in reality, when, we, when you go to deploy, we have fundamentally different challenges when deploying Windows when, uh, versus deploying Linux. So th those are things that, you know, we obviously, you're not gonna, you know, we're, we're not talking about APIs, but yet at the same time, it, we're, we may break portability and we may break other things because of just the way that we deploy them right? and, and the components that are involved. Yeah, that, that's actually really interesting. I think something both of you said, you know, kind of made me think seriously. It's it's not just the API, it is the underlying implementation sometimes. Um, and you know, you see that in, in OpenStack networking. Whew, I gotta get used to that. Um, yeah. And you know, we're directly engaged in that uh, 
one of our one of our guys is actually the PTL for that project, and he's constantly engaging with a lot of different vendors who have a lot of different implementations of these general concepts. And there's a lot of hash out that goes on in the community, just ensuring that these things work together, such that I can pick a different vendor for a particular feature and have things work for my customers in a very similar or very much the same way. Um, so sometimes it hashes out inside you know, the OpenStack community and the OpenStack project itself. Other times it, it doesn't. So another interesting thing about us is we, we run Ceph. You know, that's something that's different. And, and so we do have Swift, but we're not using Swift. We're using Ceph to implement Swift. And so what does that say about us and our interoperability? Well, we're committed to that API. We think it's important. You know? And so I think there's a lot of different ways to skin that cat. And it's just the important thing to note is it is those APIs. The things underneath do matter. So I don't know. It's kind of happens inside the community and outside the community to a certain extent. I, I guess I'm not really sure that I have something to add to that. So I'll just I'll just pass the conversation on. Yeah. Uh, all right. So um, so I think actually um, the, the thing that it makes me think when we talk about interoperability and we talk about um, uh, the, the, the things you guys have, have been bringing up, like is, is it the code, is it the, is it the API? Um, I'm, I'm of the opinion that I, I want people to run the code, right? Um, and I'll also put a pin in the Swift Ceph thing because I, I think that's an outlier uh, due to code structure uh, that doesn't work the way that the rest of the projects do uh, based on the quantum uh, sender Nova glance model. Uh, one would imagine there would be a Ceph plug in. Um, but that's a different conversation and it's it's one that, that also can be had for long amounts of time. So um, and, but if we ignore that for a second. Been. Yeah. If we ignore that for a brief second, um, the the reason that we want interoperability, right, um, is not just because we all like each other uh, and we think that we that we want to have a happy party. Um, there's a there's a real there's a real business benefit to that, right? The the the, the, the business benefit is that is that we're able to grow the market. And, and we're able to do things together that, that none of us are able to do individually. It's just not possible. Um, and and so when we so the reason that it's important to me when we talk about interoperability that we're actually uh, aligning more and more on on code and not just on uh, on APIs is that working together is is how like the business goal of working together and and winning and, and growing the market in that way also involves the community being all of us and not the community being something that each of us interact with, but that, that comprises the set of us. And we really only do that when we, when we jump into the, to the code projects themselves. Um, and so if it's just APIs, then everybody goes off and rewrites their own version of it in Java or whatever, or Ruby or whatever thing they happen to like, and then we're no better than we were three years ago. And, and if I can add to, add to that for a second, you know, then, then you, you, to your point, you're exactly right. If, if someone goes and implements it in Java and someone goes and implements it in another, another uh, software language, then you know, that, that's where you're opening yourself up for breaking interoperab interoperability, right? If we do work along that common code base, it only strengthens the project as a whole. Yeah. So I agree. So can I, can I, I, um, I actually was going to put you back on the spot because if you didn't add, I, was, I had a question, a question for you. But go ahead. Do you have a comment? Well, just, um, I mean, in my initial comments, I assumed that everyone's going to use the same code. And I think sort of, you know, here's this interface, but we'll go interf implement it differently. Um, it just doesn't really, isn't really helpful. I, I think the bigger challenge is how to make sure that people are kind of grabbing the same sets of code. So, you know, from a, from a customer perspective, if somebody says we have Grizzly, you kind of want to know, oh, it's this set of stuff, not, well, we grab this stuff and we grab something completely different, but we're both going to label it Grizzly because from a user perspective or a vendor perspective, that's a nightmare. Um, I'll, uh, I'll say, I, I sat in on the API uh, thing uh, yesterday. I was a little concerned that I heard somebody say, well, why don't we just continue constantly evolving the API and never really defining it as a certain level? From a development perspective, I can see where that's attractive, but from a user perspective, that would be disastrous. So you said two different things. The first one being, you know, how do I know what Grizzly actually is? Um, and you know, one of the challenges OpenStack has is that uh, because it is really an umbrella across every possible cloud you might want to build, uh, we have an enormous number of configuration options. I think it's what, more than 600 options now. And so we, we have proposed this project called RefStack, 
specifically to say this is this is an open stack that is going to define interop. Um, it is not any vendor's flavor of OpenStack, although all of us would love it to be our product. Uh, we are specifically making it not that, and trying to get to what is the what is the middle bar that the ecosystem, i.e., the you know the instratius is. I can't say that uh, there's too many vowels in that now. Um, <laughs> in stratus, um, what what API serves the needs of the folks who consume the API, as opposed to serves our whims as developers. So Bernard, I was going to put you on the spot because you have a unique perspective here because your company supports multiple clouds and then so interoperability for you takes on a whole new dimension be, by being able to work translation, translate workloads not just between OpenStack clouds but between other vendors' clouds, right? That's true. That we, um, and sort of the way we've done it I think is a kind of interesting um, architectural perspective which is we've created an open source product called Dasign which any of, anybody can use. And basically, we use that to encapsulate these differences. And we've created kind of a, I would call it a taxonomy of functionality across different kinds of uh, stuff like, you know, launching virtual machines or doing this or that or whatever it might be. So that way we can sort of with, um, gracefully expose the, ex the functionality of the um, of particular cloud providers. Um, you know, you've, you've sort of, served up a soft pitch on this <coughs> API stuff. Because one of the challenges we off also face is people who implement the API faithfully, but then don't execute on it. Very, you know, so we, I won't name any names, and, and actually it wouldn't be anybody at this, if, in, in this conference, but we've run into vendors who have an API that as soon as we start using it, start throttling it. Because they say, oh, you, you are actually a, a denial of service attack. <laughs> um, so there's faith. There's the syntax of the API, I would say, and then there's the semantics or the function, the operations around it. And both those are really critical for, and, and not just us, I'm not just sort of saying, oh, it's us. Just think of us as being, you know, users, us representing users who want to be able to use all these clouds. There was a, uh, oh. What, so there's, I have, I have two questions in queue, but we're gonna do yours first. Um, I, I wanna come back and talk about money. I think that's a really valid point. I, I do want to talk more about ap applications versus API. We're halfway through. I was going to ask you guys to scramble your order just to make this a little bit more interesting. Interoperate your chairs, please. I'm going to, I'm going to interoperate. Is this going to be like musical chairs where somebody goes to sit down and they... The only, this, is the only, this is the only restructuring of the... <laughs> the big win is I got the mic from Josh. So. And I've ended up in the same chair. This is good. <laughs> with this. Um, okay, go ahead, please. What's yeah, your question? So I'll just talk loud. Oh, there it is. Oh, there it is. Okay, so I'm Chris Ferris from IBM, and uh, I have that problem in spades in terms of interoperability. Um, and I'm even trying to use the same code base. But really, what it boils down to, and I think that Monty mentioned it earlier, is you know, the web just sort of works, and it works across <coughs> every, no matter what website you go to, it just works. And there's a reason for that. It was written down in like 1991, and it hasn't changed a whole lot, right? We all agree this is what HTTP is, and we're working within the parameters. We aren't going off and reinventing the wheel every week. It just works. HTML took a little while more to sort of sort itself out, but eventually the vendors worked it out and agreed this is what it is. Now we're working on five, and I know five is <laughs> we'll go beyond that. But I guess my point is this, and, 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 and Bernie mentioned this as well. We keep thinking we can keep changing the API from one release to the next. We keep thinking we can add all kinds of cool new stuff up and then expose all kinds of extensions, but that's not going to give you interoperability. You may have SPI pluggability, but you're not getting interoperability above if everybody's doing different things down below. Well, so, so HTTP is a, is a pretty simple thing compared to uh, the entire uh, set of APIs that is required to run a, a cloud, private or public. Um, and also, and if you, all if of you those want to talk about HTML, let's HTTP. talk to Microsoft. So, so. so hold on a second. I, I'd like to address you directly. I think HTTP is the wrong point of you're coming in on. You have to look at this like TCP IP. Okay? HTTP is like a vendor coming in and adding more functionality to the layer that we built to make interoperable. Right? 
like IP allows us to all communicate, it allows us to have this web, it allows us to connect these devices from any, vendor, any different vendor and gives us an entire ecosystem that allows us to build other technologies on top of. That's essentially the same thing that OpenStack is, right? Is a, is a, is a framework that allows us to add on to and build on top of, like TCP IP. So from an HTTP perspective, that would, I look at that as, oh, that's just additional functionality that we built on top of that base layer raw fundamental layer that we all agreed on from a strictly communication standpoint, right, in terms of IP. But in terms of cloud, we have a lot more things that you have to be thinking about, right? Because, you know, you've got different vendors bringing different things. Someone mentioned something about, you know, making a particular vendor choice because of particular functionality that may, that that device or component may add to your cloud. And, and once again, if we all stay true to that fundamental underlying layer, no matter how I implement it, whether it be on Hyper-V or Linux or OpenBZ or, you know, you name it, it's, uh, it, we, we still have a commonality that allows us that um, sort of, uh, that tier of, of interoperability. So. Well, so, okay. I, th I think one of the underlying pieces that you described is that at some point, the industry came together and decided that making this stuff work together was worth Before. sacrificing developer flexibility and vendor agendas in the sense of the greater good, right? And Monty talked about this a little bit earlier, and I think even Josh alluded to it. At, at some point, the OpenStack community, either by someone that's hearing from the market or just within ourselves, we're, we're gonna have to decide that a certain amount of that innovation and flexibility and that a certain amount of our independent company priorities need to run second or third to interoperability you, for our you users. Just, you just nailed it. And the problem is we haven't done that yet. I mean, I think we're we're as close at this conference with some of the things we're talking about and some of the noise that we're hearing um, to move there, but I, I don't think we've been there. And, uh, and ultimately, you know, we have to decide that being interoperable is more important than what, you know, a product person at Rackspace or a customer of Rackspace or something is screaming for, or that some developer insists he has to have to be able to do the coolest thing in the cloud. And th those are hard decisions to make. Um, I think we've all struggled with them in, in different ways, but I, I think if we don't figure that out, then we're just gonna lose that opportunity. So I think there's, um, if I could do a poll, quick poll, show of hands. How many of you on your laptop have Adobe Flash? Yeah, basically everybody. Um, what happens when a standard gets baked too early and crushes innovation is that the innovation leaves the standard and it happens somewhere else. So the innovation of the web since, what, 2001 to 2000, when did we start on five, HTML5? Happened in proprietary plugins, happened in ActiveX for a while, which was painful, no offense to Microsoft. Um, <laughs> it happened in Flash, it happened, et cetera. So the, the, other, the, the other point, and I see Todd in the room, and Todd's gonna disagree with me on this one. This is not me as a board member, this is me as uh, a, a co-founder of OpenStack. Um, we started OpenStack around a philosophy of rough consensus and working code. We swore this would never be a standards effort. There were already standards efforts. I was on them for cloud computing and they were a giant waste of time. So when, the, when we are clear on the definition of cloud and we are clear on the definition of workload, the next person who says workload in here as if it's a real term is gonna get smacked in the head. Um, Maybe we should just call it load. Load. <laughs> um, then we can start, you know, the, the retroactive application. Actually, I quoted this in my keynote at the first OpenStack Summit, the first keynote of the first summit in Austin. I quoted the fact that the RFC process of after the fact standards based on working agreement and interoperability that had been built amongst peers in small collaborative sessions was the spirit of OpenStack and will continue to be the spirit of our interop efforts. The things that we have already decided work well enough to call done, we will standardize on and then we will enforce. Also, excellent. That, everybody keep that between yourselves. Yeah. There, there should be much less agreement and much more bickering, I think, is what we need. No, I, I was going to, uh, I mean, similar to that, I think you're exactly right. Um, the, uh, of course, the, the, the sort of, the, my negative example of where, where standard sort of stuff doesn't, doesn't work out in the way that we want it to work out um, is, uh, is POSIX, right? Which was, 
uh, a, a, bunch of, a bunch of Unixes that had gone off into the weeds and they made POSIX and nobody cares. Um, because what it, what it wound up being is then it got locked into uh, a, the standards body and, and you, had a, you had a least common denominator, crappy interface um, that then couldn't move. Um, and so then as, as things came along, uh, you know, the, the GNU utilities came along which were fantastic and extended POSIX because uh, they didn't care because they wanted things to work. Uh, and then uh, Solaris decided to ship the, the GNU user space as part of Solaris. Uh, you know, Linux did the same thing, et cetera. And so then you had the working de facto standard, which was GNU, uh, and still is. Uh, and you had the, uh, and then you had the POSIX definition. I don't know if anybody's looked at POSIX tar, uh, but it doesn't work. Um, and, and so I think that, that while, while standards, why I'm a huge fan of interoperability, and I think that we need that, I think that it's really important that that, that, that emanate from Thing, things that work and that solve our problems, not that are theoretical solutions to theoretical problems, or things that are designed to, to, to brook consensus just enough so that we can say that we're having consensus, but none of us actually have to give in on anything. That never, that never happens, does it? What's that? That never happens. No, never not. By the way, just point of clarification, what prioritizing interoperability was not meant to be an endorsement for standards, because I totally agree okay. that that's a terrible yeah. way to go. Because I was gonna, yeah. You do have to make some sacrifices for interoperability. Yes. And I think there's an important the time for that to happen, but I also I want to disagree a little bit with the point that we, we have to prioritize that. I think maybe that's not what you're saying. We don't have to always prioritize that above, right? I think we're going to need these, this innovation around the edges on new APIs and new features and even extensions. I mean, there's a reason that there is an ability to extend out the OpenStack networking API because it's, it's a nascent project. And we have features we need and we want to deliver our customers that weren't there. So we built them in extensions. And when those features are available in OpenStack networking, we'll put in a shim and we'll move to the standard. We'll move to the, to the community consensus API. But I, I think the, the critical thing is it's okay to innovate. It's okay to do different things. But when the community comes to consensus, let's all gather around it and adopt it. That's yeah, the and I think that's, thing. that's the key thing is we're, we're doing the extensions, we're doing the innovation we're allowing some of those to be de facto standards. Like in Nova, there's a whole set of things that are not part of the Nova API that are quote unquote extensions that everybody thinks you're missing if you don't have them. And so we do have to get better at I think declaring that standard as it's moving because it will move rapidly, but we need to be able to say, look, if you're, if you're gonna get the Nova API, you're gonna get this set of things and, it's, and, and it needs to move more quickly than I think it has in, in a stated way. Like a lot of us that work in this get it, know that if you don't have key pairs, you're not, you're not Nova. But nobody outside that's programming knows that they should expect that, right? We've got to get better at, at our situation. So there's actually a pair of things that, that are solved by the user committee, right? One is us knowing which APIs are actually being used. In other words, the development community hearing from Instratius that, uh, you know, we expect in our taxonomy for uh, the key pairs uh, interface to be supported in every OpenStack cloud. We expect floating IPs to always be there. Um, so that's, that's how we hear which ones are important. It's also how we hear uh, which ones need to be frozen. You know, at the point, and, and it's, it's funny that the unstructured version of the user committee at this point is George Reese on Twitter, which is why we are trying to structure this slightly. But that is the, the primary source of feedback we get for the OpenStack APIs is, is George Reese's opinion of our lack of XML support. And frankly, we didn't write XML support because we didn't use it, didn't think anybody else did. Um, but it turns out we were wrong. <laughs> one last thing and then I'll, I'll, I'll let this one die. Uh, and, and I just wanted to, to piggyback on, on uh, the, uh, I'm just gonna stop prefacing what I'm gonna say and just say, say it, it rather than talking about saying it. Um, uh, is, is, is basically that I, I agree that we've gotta, we've gotta do edge, um, uh, edge innovation and, and we've gotta be able to push those things forward. Um, the, the one thing that it, um, a, along that that I think is really important is that we, we try uh, we try our best to, we, it's really hard sometimes to try and do that in the context of, of the community effort rather than over to the actual side, yeah. right? Because when it's over to the actual side, then what happens is you start going down the path and then, I mean, the community just comes right along and does the other thing and then, and then all of a sudden now it's a competing thing, right? Now it's, 
Now it's somebody with bad blood is now unhappy with some other person, and now you've got you know three different versions of the load balancer as a service, and we don't need that. It's not useful to anybody. We've got multiple different DNSs. I mean, like, can that's not necessary. And so we, and and if we if we do that, we've got enough space to do that innovation in there. Uh, and when we don't, we got to figure it out, right? Because because if if there isn't the space for that innovation to occur on the edges, but within the confines, then we're doing something wrong, you know, so and we should fix it. I'm gonna, we have five minutes <laughs> left to go. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to hold, to hold your question, if that's right, because I wanna do speed questions so we can do two or three questions. One sentence answers. I'm looking at you guys, one sentence. Um, so how do we make interop, pursuing interop profitable for the people to work on? Companies to work on. N not. Right. Go ahead. Not interop is not profitable. Interop is already profitable. I was going to say we 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 already have the momentum we built behind OpenStack. We just need to follow through on the promise. Yeah. Well, I'd say it's 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 pretty easy. You'll start getting a lot of friction from customers, who will say, "I'm not ready to adopt," because, and then. Vendors are very good at responding to dollar signs from customers. We don't have a choice. No. That's the answer. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, more interoperable solutions are usually the ones that are typically far in the pain point. Yeah. 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 It's been said. Cool. So the next question is, test is one of the things we identified as a critical component for interop. How do you make test sexy and encourage investment in tests? Uh, Todd promised this a bunch of IBM guys, so we're going we're gonna to take the IBM guys. They like doing it. They have a very strange idea of sexy. But. I, 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 thought, I thought the OpenStack CI team was already sexy. But um, um. I, I think it's more about fun. And, I mean, there, there are people that find this stuff incredibly compelling. And it's about getting them and giving them permission to go work on it, right? I mean, that's when you, you find people like Monty's team. We've certainly built up a, a, a group of those folks at, at Rackspace that are trying to get more engaged in that. And I think the more we find those people and give them permission to go do it, um, it'll happen. It's already happening. There's a lot of momentum around this. So there's one more is, is uh, acknowledgement, right? We remove roadblocks. The biggest roadblock right now is that OpenStack CI doesn't get counted. So, which we brought up yesterday, there's most of where our work and Monty's work on OpenStack happens is not counted as source code contribution because we're not in the Biturgia stats. Thank you. So those Great developers point. don't feel like they're recognized. They don't get counted. So it's not, it make it sexy by making it acknowledged. This, this came up in our previous panel of talking about technical meritocracy and people being excluded from it um, because they weren't code developers in core. Um, so, two more questions. I lost my question. Oh, so we want interop, we want to be able to claim interop. How do we get to a point where somebody can be have a certified, and do we need, and how can you claim a certified interoperable OpenStack cloud? Refstack.org. So the goal, the, the, the Skunk Works project, which is not officially an OpenStack thing because Monty and I don't, Oh, it's a thing. It's, it's a thing. It's a, it's a thing. thing. Um, vendors it's a of thing. products and services can register an endpoint and schedule a scan of their product or service, and they'll get a scorecard. These APIs you support according to the OpenStack standard, according to this version or not, with these caveats. They can then take that scorecard and present it to customers, and also at some undefined point in the future, perhaps the board could use that to regulate the use of the trademark because today's policy is Nova and Swift equals the word OpenStack. We can maybe get a little more granular. Uh, we, we actually, and as a follow-up to that, uh, we, we've solved all of the technical problems around that two hours ago in a session. Uh, and if you'd like to read the Etherpad, it's etherpad.openstack.org slash Havana dash hits dash testing. I don't believe I remembered that. Well, I think it's solving it the way we've solved every other, you know, it is about code. Right, we're going to write tests that are not vague, and, and you know, everybody's going to have open, so everybody's going to know what to expect because they're going to know what those tests look like, and 
you know, I think we, we solved this the same way we solved every other problem in OpenStack. And um, I think we've got great ideas. I mean, I think that was the most exciting event in any board meeting was when I think all four of us were there and go, this is the way we need to do this. And, um, and if anybody here wants to get involved with that, there's a huge opportunity because there's a lot of work to actually make RefStack the idea, RefStack the reality. And, uh, you know, anybody that wants to jump on that one, absolutely join us. It's a sexy thing to do. So, so that was sort of uh, what I said in my initial remarks, which is there has to be some sort of a certification test that you have to, s that every, every standard that's ever done that, that's ever been adopted has a certification test. They go through it, they get a score, and either you pass or you fail, and then the marketplace starts demanding that. And you know, my speculation is once that thing's defined and it's available, if once one large vendor sort of signs up and does that, everyone else is going to fall into place because they're, they're all going to find out, oh, those people are choosing that large vendor because that person could say, I'm certified. Oh, I better have that too. Yeah, no, from a Microsoft perspective, you, you know, any OS vendor, you always have things like hardware certification, hardware validation. And, you know, once again, from an OpenStack perspective, it obviously makes sense to be able to, if you're going to define it as OpenStack, to have some reasonable level of uh, certitude. Yeah, certitude. Can I ask the panel a question? Or in the audience? As long as I get time for my last question. Okay, you get time for the closing one. So the question is, we talked about this idea that some APIs or interfaces should be frozen, right? And we talked about some actually are still evolving. We also talked about this idea that some interop is based on just APIs, and some has to be based on running the same code, and a lot of that is about capturing this community dynamic. Is it possible that it's as simple as saying, when an API is frozen, because we've actually innovated to the point of a standard, the implementation stops mattering as much, and we could just say, you know, match the API? I, I, I would agree with that, actually. I, I believe that that's the point where, um, where it's less, once, the, once, once we've evolved it to the point where it's, it's a thing, like it, and it's, it's, it's a, it's a, Memcached is actually a really good example of this, right? Memcached, it's actually a reasonably simple thing. It turns out it's, a little bit harder to do it properly, um, but it's it's an understandable thing. Um, it got to the point where it was it was it was solid. They made a tool called Mem Capable, uh, which you can run against a Memcached server to, to make sure that it works. Uh, and and they did this around the time that it had become such a normal thing that people were just writing an Memcached API in front of some service that they'd built. So there's now like eight implementations of Memcached, but that didn't at that point take away from the growth of Memcached itself, right? Memcached itself had won, because why the hell would you run anything else other than Memcached for that purpose, right? And, and so that actually proved that it had, that it had won the space rather than do the other thing, right? So I, I, would, I would be right in with that. That's good. If you, get, you just want a thumbs up on that? I, t I think we've got agreement on that, unless there's... Right, and I think this is important. We have a tendency to see things as very black and white. And the nuanced answer here is that over time, the definition and the need is going to change. And I think that sums up a lot of what our discussion was about. My last question, I was shifting gears a little bit, is you're going to go home, you're going to talk to your significant others, your parents, your pets, whatever it is you want to talk to, and you're going to say, I was on an interop panel. What are they going to think you meant? So I, I'm just moving into a place uh, in the village in in New York. Um, so I'm I'm fairly certain that they're gonna think something involving a wig, or or some article of clothing I don't normally wear, or possibly operations related to such things, uh, might might be what this was about, which I don't think is what we've talked about so far. Uh, being strapped to a board or waiting surgery, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> so you, you know me well enough to know this answer. I have no friends outside of OpenStack, so they will all know <laughs> exactly what I was talking about. And very few inside. No, I'm just kidding. Oh. 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 Won't you be my neighbor? It's the sweater vest. Well... What I can say is I've given up on having those conversations with anybody in my family. Um, they just go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, let's talk about something important. Um, so I probably won't have that. But I, I definitely will be saying that. Uh, <laughs> These days.
things that's, are that's free. the kind of responses I get at home. I, I definitely, I definitely am going to pass on to George Reese that he is the de facto um, test harness for the OpenStack API. George Reese is a service. It's great. <laughs> You, you, should, you should see what he puts onto the internal um, water cooler Skype chat that we have. The stuff that goes on Skype is, or on uh, Twitter is the um, censored version. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, mine's going to be a little bit like Bernard's because so I'm about ready to go on a three month sabbatical. My, wa my wife's reaction is going to be, thank God you're going to sabbatical so I don't have to hear this again. So that's about what I'll hear. Everybody, thank you for participating. Panelists, I think they did a great job. We really appreciate it.